feel that I'm at a bit of a disadvantage because this is one of those rooms where the person asking to speak is far less of an expert than the people sitting in the audience. So I don't know if I'm going to have any particular wisdom to share with, with all of you when I, when I look across the room and I see so many people I know that are leaders in engineering and transportation and local government and business and everything else. I, I'm at a bit of a disadvantage. And, but what I'm going to do is, is talk about a couple of things that have been on my mind as it relates to transportation in our state and in our communities. And then I'm going to take the liberty to talk about a couple of things that are near and dear to my heart and then transition quickly to questions because I'm sure with the wisdom that exists in this room, uh, there are a lot of questions or things that are on your mind as it relates to the work that we're doing in, in state government. Uh, so on transportation, first of all, I think it's, it's clear to all of us how important transportation is and how, how the nature of it uh, has changed and is changing and how the thought on it is changing. Um, it seems like uh, we had a, a model maybe 20 or 30 years ago that is thankfully very different from today, uh, particularly as it relates to our urban areas. I remember I was living in Columbus about 10 years ago going to school at Ohio State when they started working on taking all these one-way streets and turning them into two-way streets because the old mentality was rushing people into the city and rushing people out of the city but not encouraging them to stay in the city and walk around and drive around and visit retailers and everything else. Um, and uh, <laughs> one of my favorite headlines, and I'm sure that whoever at the Columbus Dispatch came up with this had a good chuckle about it, but when, when, they, were, when they were making the streets two ways, uh, one of the streets, one of the, the, the main streets, that, that the first one that they were doing uh, was in downtown Columbus and it was Gay Street. And the headline was, Gay to go both ways. <laughs> so, <laughs> think about that for a second. Think about that for a second. <laughs> But the, the, the fact is that we're, we're changing the way that we think about transportation. We're focusing more uh, on, uh, on, on, on biking and trails and pedestrians. And even here in Northeast Ohio, where we have some challenging winters, uh, we, we, we really need to focus on that. Uh, obviously, one of the things that's a big concern for a lot of us is the, uh, is, is the way things are not working as smoothly as they should at the federal level. I, I, I fear uh, that... Um, Things have gotten so dysfunctional in Washington that something as fundamental as transportation funding uh, doesn't work the way it's supposed to. And, and I think that we've got good representatives here in, in our region, but there are too many people that want to try to sort of pursue narrow ideological uh, goals, and, and, and they're allowing that to get in the way of something that has normally been a bipartisan uh, uh, focus and a bipartisan priority, something like transportation funding. I mean, there are some basic things that government has to do right. You know, public safety, transportation, education. These are the sort of the blocking and tackling of, of, of government. And if we can't get that right, then, then we've got uh, uh, then we've got some concerns. And I'm going to talk about uh, uh, some of my some of my things that, that I'm trying to focus on that relate to that here in, in a couple of minutes. Uh, but one of those is that uh, the the, uh, the motor fuel tax has for a long time been a pretty darn good way of funding uh, road infrastructure. It's been a pretty, as I say, a pretty elegant way of, of funding it because the more fuel you burn, generally the more wear and tear you put on the roads, it works pretty well, uh, but its vehicles are becoming thankfully more fuel efficient. And I've, I've parked my little hybrid out front. I drive about 30,000 miles a year though. And uh, you know, people are starting to burn less fuel. We've got vehicles that don't burn any fuel now. and, and uh, uh, some that are powered by CNG, which is a wonderful way to power vehicles, particularly heavy trucks. Uh, so we're getting to, to, to the point where we need to start thinking um, and, and thinking very, very much forward about what we're going to do when the motor fuel tax is no longer the right way to, uh, to, to, to finance our, our roads and bridges. Uh, and, and something else that, that, that we need to think about as well is the idea of raising the motor fuel tax. Now, that's heresy to some people. They don't even want to talk about it. They're worried that they'll be hung from a yard arm for even bringing up the, the idea that it's a possibility. Uh, but as we know, having that at a fixed number of pennies per gallon, uh, it doesn't adjust for inflation. It doesn't go up. And, and, and for some reason, there's not been the political will to talk about, talk about the need for, for raising that. But as we all know in this room, we have aging infrastructure uh, that we need to invest in and that we need to keep up and that we need to uh, make sure is there and, and safe and ready to go for the future. Uh, I'm glad that, that uh, what we've been trying to focus on is, is the maintenance of, of existing roadways. In some limited cases, we're, we're building new roadways, but really the focus that we've had is on maintaining uh, what we have right now and maintaining it in a way 
uh, that it'll last for, for a long, long time to come. I think that uh, there's some opportunities that we have here in Ohio. I think that we're a state that's very well positioned to be a leader in logistics uh, because if we are a leader in logistics, because of our geographical location, because of our workforce, I think that uh, we have some underutilized assets and, and, and I think chief among them is our water transportation. I think that we need to be doing more with, um, uh, with multimodal and, uh, and one of those is, is, uh, is with uh, Great Lakes transportation, particularly containerized transportation uh, of, of cargo in the Great Lakes and I think that that's something that's a great opportunity and, and a place that, that, that we should be investing and, and growing. Uh, another place that, uh, that, that I think that we need to look at investing in is public transit. I think that, um, well, I mean, the numbers show you that the state of Ohio has historically underinvested in public transit, and I think that it's something that, uh, that we need to put more focus into. Um, people want to live and work in urban areas more and more, and particularly people from my generation uh, like that uh, livable city, not, not just a nine to five town like we had for, for too long, but, but a 24 seven kind of a town where you can live and work and play all within the same area and, and, uh, and vibrant cities require good public transportation. And we've got good public transportation here, but there's some more investment that we can do in that. So we've got both challenges and opportunities as it relates to transportation for the future of our state. And we've got challenges and opportunities as it relates to the way our institutions of government function. And so I'll, I'll close with, with some thoughts on that. Uh, we have a, uh, I think a, a, a real opportunity this November to make a big change on the way state government functions by, uh, by the voters hopefully approving issue one. Um, I've said for a long time that uh, the, the two, in my mind, the two most, uh, the two contributing factors that cause dysfunction both in state and federal government are the way we draw district lines and the way we finance campaigns. And, uh, and this November we have a chance to change the way that we draw district lines at the state legislative level. Uh, the, the, the term gerrymandering is something everybody here is familiar with. Uh, that, that's actually a little pearl of wisdom for you. That's a mispronunciation. It should actually be gerrymandering. Uh, it started in 1812. That was when that term was first used by a Massachusetts newspaper man. And it was the governor of Massachusetts, Elbridge Gerry, who was one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, uh, who drew a district that looked like a salamander in order to benefit his party, which at the time was the Democratic Republican Party. Uh, yes, that was a party at one point. Uh, and, uh, and, and his party was, was benefited by the way he drew this contorted district that looked like a salamander up along sort of Cape Ann in, in, in Massachusetts. And so the bad news is it's gotten worse. Uh, with modern GIS technology, with modern polling, we know which houses are the Democratic houses and which houses are the Republican houses, and the, these districts are drawn in such a surgical way as to create a political benefit for one party or the other, and, and that's a problem. Uh, the, 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 the problem that it causes is there's too many people that serve in non-competitive districts. Um, and uh, I serve with great people, I really do, 132 of them, uh, in both the House and the Senate, Democrats and Republicans, and I really believe that the vast majority of them, vast majority of them are there because they love the state of Ohio and they want to try to do their part to make it better. Uh, the problem is, however, when they live and serve in a district where they're never going to have a general election opponent, the only thing they have to worry about is winning a primary. Their entire political survival is based on winning a primary. And a first-year poli-sci student can tell you what happens when your sole focus is on winning a primary. Republicans go to the right, Democrats go to the left, and what that leaves is a vacuum in the center. And the center is where the problems are solved. The center is where consensus is built. The center is where statesmen and women come together to compromise, which is not a dirty word. It's how problems are solved in a democracy. And the center has been vacated in many senses in both the state legislature uh, and certainly at the federal level because everybody has migrated to the polls, to the left and to the right. And so I think that we have a great opportunity this November uh, to, to work to fix that by changing the way district lines are drawn so that the next time that happens, following the next decennial census in 2020, and the next time they draw lines in 2021, we have a much more balanced process where both the majority and the minority voice are heard and we can craft lines that are more competitive uh, and more reasonable for the state of Ohio. Now, what that leaves 
is a, uh, uh, one thing that is a big part of that that's been left out is the redrawing of congressional districts. Uh, now, my friend Senator Sawyer and I, uh, a Democrat and a Republican, both from Summit County, uh, we're the troublemakers that, that keep pushing uh, that we need to change the way congressional districts are drawn as well, and we've introduced a resolution to do that, and we've had hearings in the Constitutional Modernization Commission, uh, and we hope to have more hearings and, and get that conversation going, uh, because step one is changing the way that state legislative lines are drawn. Uh, step two is to improve that process for the drawing of congressional districts as well. It has a big impact on the way our institutions of government work. And it's something that I know everybody in this room cares about. Um, I think for too long uh, we have, have talked about, uh, uh, particularly in my party, uh, when, when it's campaign season, we talk bad about government. Uh, we talk about how, how we need to uh, cut the size of government and we need to constrain government. And that's fine from an ideological standpoint, and I agree with some aspects of that. Uh, however, we are all part of and dependent on government, and we need government to work. We need government that's efficient, sure, but we need government that is functional. And the institutions of our government are struggling right now uh, because of some of the decisions that we've made to pursue partisan goals instead of uh, what's best for the state of Ohio and for the country. And that's something I care deeply about, and I know that all of you do as well. Uh, there's a lot that we're working on down in Columbus. Obviously, we passed a, uh, another uh, budget this spring. and. Uh, uh, we'll be looking at uh, perhaps a mid-biennium budget uh, correction here coming up in the, in the early part of next spring. Uh, there's talk about a capital budget coming up in January or February, so I'm sure that everybody will be eagerly watching on, uh, on that front. And, uh, and there's plenty of work to do for the state of Ohio. Uh, one bill that, that I'll, I'll just have to make a pitch for that, that I've been working on is online voter registration. I know not uh, a direct concern necessarily of the folks in, in this room, uh, but uh, for the way that we, uh, the, that we do voter registration that hasn't changed in 150 years by scribbling information down on a piece of paper and folding it up in an envelope and mailing it in uh, to the Board of Elections, 28 other states have, have modernized that system and gone to online voter registration. It's more efficient, it's more secure, uh, and it's more convenient for voters, which is most important. Uh, and uh, we passed with bipartisan support, which is rare, for bipartisan support on an elections issue. For some reason, elections bills normally polarize people, but we got nearly unanimous bipartisan support for online voter registration. We passed it out of the Senate back in the spring. It's over in the House, and I sincerely hope that the House has hearings on it because it's time for Ohio to join the majority of other states that offer online voter registration so that people can start taking part in that two-step process, first register, second vote. So uh, with that, uh, I, I look forward to the questions that, that all of you have and I appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. and I would encourage you to consider doing the same on, on issue one. Uh, issue two and issue three are related. Um, I'll start with issue two. Issue two was, uh, was put on the ballot uh, by the legislature in response to issue three. Uh, issue two does something that really probably should have been done years ago because many other states have a provision like this. Issue two would add a non-monopoly provision to our state constitution. I mean, the founding document of our state uh, it is the state constitution, and unfortunately, through the initiative process, it's been used to create business opportunities for certain groups of people. Think the casinos, love them or hate them, that's something that probably doesn't belong in the state constitution, and, 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 and what's being considered right now with issue three would provide the opportunity for a small group of people to benefit from the sale, uh, from the growing and, and the business of selling uh, marijuana in the state. And so issue two would create a, uh, a provision in the Constitution that would prevent anybody from using it, uh, using our state Constitution to create a protected business model for themselves and themselves alone. 
Again, the argument is that that doesn't belong in the state constitution. Uh, that's not the way uh, that, that the constitution of the state should, should function. Um, and so that's issue two. Um, I'm planning on voting yes on, on issue two. Issue three is the, uh, is the marijuana issue. Uh, the, uh, the, the, I think that everybody's hearing the arguments on that, and there are reasonable arguments to be made on, on both sides of the legalization question. Um, I, I think that uh, uh, you know to sort of present both sides of the argument uh, from a practical standpoint, I would ask you to just think about: Is there anybody in the state of Ohio that wants marijuana that's not able to get it? Honestly. Well, no, probably not. The problem is that it is a, I mean, it's an illicit, it's a multi-hundred million dollar a year, maybe a billion dollar a year illicit industry that's not taxed and not regulated. And so some people, practically speaking, say, well, why don't we just go ahead and regulate it and tax it and make it available in a legal sense? Because adults that want to have that product probably already have access to it anyway, so let's stop kidding ourselves. The other side to that argument is that uh, for, our, for our businesses, the, the, one of the biggest concerns that I hear is a workforce related problem, and that is they have a hard time finding people that can pass a drug test, uh, that can operate equipment or, or be in a position uh, where they're in, in, in charge of, of something where that business, uh, because of their uh, liability or whatever else, they decided that those people that do this job have to pass a drug test and they're struggling to find people that are qualified to do the job and are going to show up to work on time and can pass a drug test. And so, you know, there's a very practical sort of business side uh, reason why a number of businesses at the Chamber of Commerce and folks like that have come out against this because they're saying, well, it's already bad. If you make it legal, it's even going to be worse and it's going to be harder for us to find qualified people that are drug free. There's the, there's the social uh, uh, argument against it as well. Uh, that um, you know, we as parents can tell our children, you shouldn't do this because it's bad for you and illegal. And if you take away that and illegal part, then maybe more people would be encouraged to try it. I don't know. Uh, I don't know if that argument is keeping people from trying it right now. But uh, so that, that, that's sort of the both sides. And again, there's a reasonable argument to be made on both sides of the legalization question. Um, I think that we should be open-minded about legalization for medical purposes if it's tightly controlled and regulated in the right way. I mean, you think about what, uh, what kind of things are available by prescription at your local pharmacist's office. There's some very dangerous, very addictive substances that we prescribe to people um, through, our, through our pharmacy system. And, and, and in some ways, these are also very... Uh, positive life life uh, uh, changing things that help people live a better life through the the medicines that they can receive but there's some heavy duty stuff that we dispense through our pharmacies and to say that you can have all of these heavy duty chemicals available at your pharmacist but you're not allowed to have this plant that grows in the woods because we've said that it's bad that that seems to me kind of a strange way of thinking and so i think that we ought to to, to be looking seriously at a at a, at a medical marijuana uh, uh, program that's, that's well regulated where you, you receive a prescription from a doctor to get the oil or whatever else helps people to deal with whatever maladies they have. The reason why I'm probably, and, and I've got my absentee ballot sitting on my counter at home, I'm going to be filling it out here in the next day or two, the reason why I'm planning on voting no on issue three is because I don't like the way they're going about it. Uh, I think that uh, to create a monopoly where 10 groups of people have the sole ability to benefit from this new industry uh, is problematic just from that standpoint, the social arguments about legalization aside. And so I think that if we as a state are going to legalize marijuana, this is not the way to do it. And so there's a lot to think about. I mean, you know, uh, I think that it's, uh, I think that thoughtful Ohioans should, should examine both sides of the argument and make the decision that they think is best. I personally am a no vote on issue three because specifically of the way that they're going about it. I don't think this is the way to legalize marijuana in Ohio if we want to do that. Other questions? Yes, sir. You touched a little bit on uh, a motor fuel tax and being from the mayor of a smaller community and knowing that our surface transportation projects are uh, repaving, resurfacing, stuff like that is basically in the $300,000 per mile range. At our current budget, we can do about three three miles a year. 
why is there so much resistance to raising the motor fuel tax that would come back and benefit the smaller local communities? The volatility in gas prices, once we enact it, and you put a two or three cent a gallon motor fuel tax in the state of Ohio, the, and people start seeing the results of what this would do for their local community, I think that all the, the, um, the resistance would go away. What we found is when we show people what we're doing with their money and we improve our local community, they are not as against spending the money mm -hmm. as long as you can see the results of it. And, you know, gasoline prices at sheets goes up three cents in a matter of minutes. If we put that two or three cent a gallon tax on there, the amount of money that it generates in a year in the state of Ohio is just, it's monumental. And it would go a lot to help the community. And, 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 and that's a great academic argument for why, and I agree with you, for why we should consider raising the motor fuel tax. I'll start in, in, in reverse order a little bit. You were talking about this idea that generally when citizens know where their money is going to be spent, they're more likely to approve it. So when you have a levy for a specific purpose and people know this is what my money is being spent on, they're more likely, and polling shows this and history shows this, they're more likely to approve new spending, new revenue for things that they can understand and tangibly sort of grasp. Uh, whereas people are resistant to the idea of raising taxes just for sort of general purpose government. People don't trust often uh, that the decision makers in government are going to spend their money wisely. And so I think that that's part of it is that there's a, a an information gap. I think that everybody in this room knows this, but a lot of the citizens out there don't realize that every penny of their motor fuel tax goes to road and, and, and bridge infrastructure. It's, it's what it's for. Uh, but I think that a lot of people don't realize that. They think that it's just a tax and it goes off and it gets spent by some bureaucrat somewhere and, and, and so they're against that. That's one part. The other part is the lack of courage um, because people that have to get reelected to keep their job every two or four years know that that campaign commercial writes itself. So and so voted to raise your gasoline cost. I mean, it's an easy campaign commercial to write because it's, it's something that, that everybody can understand. Everybody who drives an automobile who stands there every couple days and dispenses fuel and watches those numbers run up and thinks, oh my gosh, how high is it going to go? They, they, they understand that that costs them money. And that's money that they can't spend to, to take their kids out to dinner or, or, or to invest in college or, or whatever else. And so, you know, that's one of those things that a lot of people are afraid of because they'll be tarred with this, this you know, this, this ad that, that, that so-and-so voted to raise your, your, your gasoline tax. Um, and so that's something, it's easy to understand. John Q. Public can understand, and, and they will in their mind say that this politician is responsible for me spending more every four days when I go to the gasoline pump, and that's something that people are afraid of. Um, I think that we, we need to, to work on getting uh, uh, the information out there to people so that they understand that their motor fuel tax, I mean, it's a use fee. Motor fuel tax is a, is a user fee, essentially. The more fuel you use, the more road you use. That's why non-road, you know, off-road fuel is not taxed, right? We have the diet fuel and the undiet fuel for that purpose with diesel. Uh, and so, you know, that's part of it. And then the other thing that, that I mentioned is that, that as a way to fund roads and, and, and bridges and infrastructure, transportation infrastructure, motor fuel tax is going to have to be replaced at some point in the future, inevitably. Uh, but even for now, you know, instead of a fixed number of pennies per gallon, if it was a percentage-based tax, then the cost, uh, then, then, the, then the, the revenue would go up with the cost of the commodity. And the, the beautiful thing about that is that the commodity cost of fuel tends to parallel the cost of construction because what's asphalt made out of? Petroleum. You know, construction vehicles burn a lot of petroleum. And so the cost of building new roads and, and maintaining roads tends to go up with the, with the cost of fuel, uh, but the, 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 the revenue generated by the motor fuel tax does not. And it relies on elected officials to cast a, a politically difficult vote to raise that, and nobody wants to do it. So that, that's, the, that's the rub. Other questions? Way in the back. Yes, sir. Uh, Senator, first of all, this is personal for me. 
Thank you, thank you. But to hear that we've got people on both sides of the aisle talking to each other, working on a project, that means a lot to a lot of people in the state of Ohio. Thank you. Number, uh, second question is, this is the second time you mentioned about the gas tax and it's fading and going away. I can tell you a man of vision, so do you have something that you think might work and uh, to talk about the, how we can replace it? Sure. Well, uh, uh, first of all, thank you on, on the bipartisan thing. I mean, to me, that's just second nature. Uh, as I've always said, it in the Senate, a whole lot of other people. I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in the Senate, each of us represent 360,000 constituents. Those are 360,000 souls that only have one state senator. And if, if I'm not doing my job, then, then, then they're losing out. And likewise, uh, when one of my colleagues is is ignored simply because of the party he or she comes from, uh, then, then you're ignoring the constituents that they represent, and everybody deserves a voice in the state legislature. So, uh, you know, I think that, that to me, bipartisanship is just second nature, and sure, everything gets done based on who's in the majority. That's practical. You need 51% to get anything accomplished in the legislature, uh, but you need to cooperate with your colleagues on the other side of the aisle as well. Uh, on replacements for the motor fuel tax, I've been interested in this topic for a while. And I attended a conference in D.C. two years ago uh, that was hosted by the U.S. Department of Transportation for state leaders, and it was talking about some of the ideas on this. And, and again, this would be something that would be ha it would by necessity have to be enacted at the federal level uh, to replace the motor fuel tax, and we're probably years away from doing it. But the ideas out there are a per mile. Um, tax or something like that. There's some logistical difficulties with how do you do that? Do you make people come in to have their odometer checked every year and then do people um, commit fraud and roll back their odometers? How do you how do you do that? I mean I think that one of the other things is, is more toll facilities. Now certain parts of the state, we're in Northeast Ohio because we've got the turnpike, we're kind of accustomed to that. There's other parts of the state where if you talk about more toll facilities, they will tar and feather you and run you out of town. It's just a, it's a cultural thing, and, and also certain states are that way. Uh, I was talking on Monday with a colleague from uh, Arkansas, and, uh, and he said, we have no toll roads in Arkansas, and the first politician that proposes that we have a toll road in Arkansas will be immediately run out of office. So, I mean, you know, that, that, that's a, a, a challenge. Uh, I think that, that, that we all know that down in the southern part of the state, we're talking about the Brent Spence Bridge, which is desperately in need of replacing. Uh, if you've driven through Cincinnati, you know what I'm talking about. And uh, Ohio has gone on the record, the state legislature uh, and, and local leaders in Cincinnati is supporting making that a toll bridge. Um, unfortunately, in Kentucky, they won't even think about it. They won't even talk about it. And because it's a multi-state bridge, we have to have cooperation from both sides of that. And, uh, you know, so that, that's a, a challenge. It's a political challenge that is causing an infrastructure challenge. Uh, and so, you know, that's something that we need to look at. So, you know, other technological ideas for how we can replace the motor fuel tax, and then also the, 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 the potential of, of more uh, toll facilities, particularly with the, the technological uh, availability of plate readers and easy pass and that kind of thing. I mean, it's not the it's not the old toll booth with, you know, toll booth Willie sitting there collecting your quarters. It, it, it may be a much more modern uh, thing than that. So, you had something else? Yes. Uh, along with the, the uh, that, in Pennsylvania, there are roads where there's toll booths. There are no people there. You throw your quarter in and just go straight through. Yeah. So, that's something you have to think. The other thing, uh, are you aware of the hard work that ODOT and Opta, which is the Ohio Public Transportation Association, have worked on uh, their uh, big plan for have you seen that? Are we talking about the report that came out um, early in the... The needs report. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I hope every member of the state legislature has read that. And again, it, it shows pretty clearly that we need to invest more in public transit. I mean, I, I do everything, or generally everything, on the 1 to 50 scale. When we're talking about just about anything, I ask, so what are the other states doing? Where does Ohio fit on that? And we tend to, maybe it's just a Midwestern thing, but we tend to be like right at the top of the bell curve. We're never the, we're never the most and we're never the least. We're never the first and we're never the last. We're always sort of right in, the, in, the, in that comfortable middle as a state, historically. Uh, unfortunately, on transportation infrastructure, or on, on, on public transit infrastructure, we're at the back of the list. 
Now, in fairness, one thing that doesn't take into account, that's state spending. It doesn't necessarily take into account local spending. And thankfully, uh, particularly in counties like Summit, we've, we've supported with local taxes uh, public transit. But that's not the, 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 the long-term answer. We as a state, the state of Ohio, needs to invest more in public transit. I'm, I'm an evangelist on that. Thanks. Yep. Also, way in the back. Yes, I would like to echo uh, the prior comments about your spirit of compromise. Uh, not only is it refreshing, but uh, I would encourage you, uh, one of our local congressmen, uh, just north of us a little bit, uh, kind of gave up on that and, and stepped aside. And that was a big shame because he was, a, he was a, a central guy who tried to get things done and recognized how important the spirit of compromise is to that. So I, too, applaud you for, for that and <coughs> wanted to say it. I also have a, a question that I would uh, like to uh, pro propose or, or perhaps hear your views. Uh, as a county engineer uh, in our business, uh, we, we rely both on gas taxes revenue and license plate fees. Uh, with the advent of alternative sources of fuel, which in the future are only going to become more elaborate, I'm sure, as we become less and less dependent on fossil fuel. Uh, perhaps a, uh, a temporary solution before a long-term solution of a per mile basis could be to uh, consider increasing the cost of license plates for non-fuel, non-fossil fuel vehicles, whether they be hybrids or all electrics or, or whatever. Uh, any thoughts on that subject? Sure. Well, first of all, it's something that, that I would be open to. I would say, though, that uh, there, there's kind of like with any good argument, there's, there's two good uh, arguments, one on, on each side of that. And, and one is that we want to encourage the, for a variety of obvious reasons, we want to encourage the adoption of alternative fuel vehicles. We want to encourage the adoption of CNG vehicles and electric, electric vehicles, and in some cases, uh, the ROI is not yet there without some support from, from the government or, or tax credits or, or whatever else. I mean, you know, most of us or all of us, the whole theory of economics is based on the rational consumer. And, and when, when you make a decision about, am I going to buy uh, this gasoline-powered vehicle for 20000 or am I going to buy this CNG-powered vehicle or this electric vehicle that's 25000 well, i got to figure out how to make up that delta unless I'm just extremely altruistic and have money to throw around, which most of us are not, at least have money to throw around, most of us are somewhat altruistic, but the, the $5,000 delta <laughs> between the cost of my, my traditionally powered vehicle and my alternatively powered vehicle, people want to know sort of how am I going to make that up and make that make sense economically. And so, you know, in some ways we don't want to do things to discourage that, uh, and, and so having a more expensive license plate fee for alternative vehicles would, would prove to be a discouragement to that. Uh, and so that's you know something we'd have to think long and hard about. And then the other thing and, and is just that there's this deep-seated resistance to increasing any kind of government revenues, particularly within people from my party, even if it makes sense. Uh, and you know it's something that uh, you know I, I, get, I get it why I understand why. Uh, but it's something that I think people need to be more open-minded about. We need to keep taxes low, but we also need to, to make sure that we're funding the essential things that government does. And sometimes that means that we, yeah, we may want to reduce this tax and, and look to, to raise that other as we find better ways to generate revenue that is needed to operate government. So it's, uh, those are kind of the, the, the two problems with that, although I think it's a, it's a reasonable idea for, for conversation. Other questions? Yeah, Jane. When you talk about um, monopolies, mm -hmm. we all look at road salt. Is there anything that could be done to come up with um, incentives or enhancements for, from the state for us to be able to come up with alternate methods, grind such as that, um, to eliminate the need for us to continue to be subject to these raising costs for road salt? So the question comes uh, on the, the cost of road salt and, and the idea that there's a small number of suppliers and so that can affect the, the, the market and how competitive that market is. I mean, I, I, the good news is that there's a lot of alternatives out there uh, starting to become more and more available and, and cost effective. I know Brian 
is one. The state's using it a lot on, on the interstates, and, and the turnpike is using it. There's something with beet juice, which is, I think, pretty interesting. I don't know if that's economical yet, uh, but I think that's probably more ecological for sure to use beet juice to, to uh, not beetle juice, <laughs> beet juice to, uh, to, uh, to, to melt salt. And the other thing is being smarter. I mean, they put the EPOC system, and that's what it's called, uh, the, 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 uh, and then there's some other that are, that are kind of a GPS based system. There are, yeah, hills and curves where you need to apply more salt. There are straightaways where you probably need to turn that thing down. I was actually a snowplow driver in my past life uh, in the Army. And uh, I, I always joke with the guys from ODOT that my, my snowplow had a 50 caliber machine gun on the roof of it. <laughs> no, you guys don't get to do that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we, but we were very careful about our salt supply because we were out in the middle of nowhere. And for us, we had to drive a dangerous road in order to go get more salt. So we were very you know, economical about our salt. And I know that all of you are very economical about how you use the salt as well. Now, I know that there was a settlement recently uh, by the Attorney General's office as it relates to, to, to salt purchasing, and I'm not an expert on that, but I, hopefully that, that sends a, a signal to, to, to people about doing the right thing. And then also, uh, I know that, that, that when we can do sort of uh, collaborative buying, and when, every, when people have uh, sort of that, that purchasing power of working together uh, in a collective sense to, to buy their, their commodities like salt, that that can be helpful as well. And many of us are in a collective body, but, the, um, but we got the board back, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. and then they raised the rates for this next year. Okay. So it gives one hand takes on the other hand. Sure. So next, some zero. Yeah, so I mean, I think it's something that we need to keep an eye on um, as far as the, 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 the pricing of that. I mean, I get it that like any commodity, uh, the price is going to rise and fall based on supply and demand and projections for how much use there's going to be and based on externalities like, uh, you know, how productive is this mine uh, that's, that's mining salt or do they have a shutdown because of something, uh, you know, geological going on at that mine and that impacts the supply. And so there's all kinds of things at play. But I, the good news is, I think more so than in the past, a lot of people are watching closely. So I think that the, the, the salt suppliers at least should be um, on, on, on alert that, uh, that they need to be on their best behavior because uh, you know people are paying attention to, the, the, they can't just be arbitrarily raising the prices. So. The, the issue is mainly with the transportation. It's talking more than the mining itself. Is it? Yeah. And that costs. That, you know, in one district, there's a big difference <coughs> in the cost from one county to the other. Mm -hmm. So that, that is the issue. Sure. And a heavy, and bulky commodity like that is hard to transport. Sure. We had a bad winter. Sure. And I know that every winter we hear the stories about some community is, is on the verge of running out of, of salt, and they're going to, I mean, you know, it's something that's a, that's a, that's a concern. I, I think on the positive side, though, we've gotten smarter about how we use, how we use our salt uh, and how we use that supply. And it has a big impact uh, on the environment as well, and that's something that a lot of people are starting to pay attention to. It used to be just blast as much salt out there as you can you know, keep that thing spinning. And uh, I think that we've gotten smarter about that because of, you know, not only the cost, but also the ecological impact. Helen. Um, the county is doing charter county uh, consulting work. Okay. Uh, so the consulting work is going to be done by the county and the county instead of your lawyers. Is it possible that the uh, two of you could work with Summit County Council on redistricting uh, this, this fall? There's two competing ballots on the uh, issue. Now, one is one from Summit County Council and one is from a bipartisan group uh, to stop the gerrymandering. I like that. I have an invitation today. Thank you for that. Uh, and I just wonder if there's, I know we're a charter county, but is there something that the uh, state of Ohio could do to work with them like you hope to do with uh, the federal after you do the state's redistricting? Well, and, and uh, so the question is, as it relates to local district line drawing, I mean, the problem with redistricting at the federal level, state level, local level, is that um, it, it has sort of always been a winner-take-all proposition. And we've said, well, elections have consequences, and my party holds the pen, so we get to draw lines however we want, and, and sorry for your bad luck. Uh, the problem with that, though, is that it ends up with the politicians are picking their voters instead of the voters picking their politicians, which you know is like democracy 101. And, and you know we, we don't we don't want gerrymandering. It, it's a bad or gerrymandering. It's a bad thing. Um, the, the 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 solution, though, to local 
line drawing, county line drawing has to be done at the local level. I mean, we can't main, uh, mandate that on, on them, or we can encourage it, I suppose. And maybe we could mandate it. It's probably not the right thing to do for the, for the sort of local control aspect. Uh, but the, you know, the good news is, one way or another, with, the, with, with those two proposals that are on the ballot this November uh, in Summit County, that, that uh, will hopefully change to a less partisan system for, for drawing lines at the county level here in Summit County, and hopefully at the state legislative district level as soon as issue one passes. And then, you know, the challenge that's going to be left for me, sort of rolling my boulder uphill as I continue to do, is to try to change the way that we draw uh, those congressional districts. And, and I can tell you that there's a lot of people that don't want me to be successful, that don't want those congressional districts to be drawn in a more balanced way. And, uh, that's fine, but I, I make the argument that it's not about what's good for one party or the other. It's about what's good for, for our system and for the state of Ohio. So, you know, I, I, I encourage folks to, uh, to to look at those two issues that are on the ballot this November. And essentially, the, it seems like the, the biggest distinction between the two is they both set up the same framework. For the county redistricting proposals, if, if everybody's familiar, I think they're 22 and 23. Is that the? 21 and 22. 21 and 22. Um, they, they both have the same framework for sort of 2020 going forward for how those lines would be drawn, again, following the decennial census. The, the question uh, is, the, the, the distinction between them is should that be done immediately? Should we immediately redraw the way that the districts work in Summit County? Um, you know, I've got some concerns about that. There's a history of this in Ohio, because I've, I've become a redistricting nerd, so to speak, and, and I was actually joking with my wife last night, our, our four-year-old would not go to sleep, and I was saying, well, I can talk to her about redistricting. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it's something I care about and something I know is important, but it can be kind of a wonky and, and, and boring issue, uh, but the fact is in the 1860s, 70s, and 80s, yes, 1860s, 70s, and 80s in Ohio, so over 200 years ago, uh, we had, uh, or, or 200, just at 200 years ago, uh, or just under 200 years ago, rather, we had a, <laughs> the math is wonderful, we had a, uh, uh, we had a problem where the, the state legislature realized that we can redraw lines whenever we wish. And so the state legislature started redrawing lines every time the balance of power changed in the state legislature. And what it created was this like whipsaw Hatfield and McCoy kind of retribution war going back and forth between, at the time it was the Whigs, I think, and one other party, so the parties were different then, but, but they were changing the lines like every four years, and nobody knew what, what district they were in, it was very confusing, it created all kinds of disruption, so we don't want to have lines redrawn more often than is necessary. It creates confusion which leads to sort of apathy from the voters. If they don't understand it, then they tend to stay out of it and not be involved in, in, in the process. And so, you know, the, 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 there's a concern there. But uh, definitely changing the way that we draw lines in Summit County is a good thing, and, and so I'd encourage you to take a look at 21 and 22. Other questions? Yes, sir. Um, Senator, on the, the question of funding government as a local official, of course, I'm concerned about state's participation in local government funding. And uh, as we all know in this room, there's been a substantial adjustment in how the state participates. Adjustment, that's a euphemism for what happened. At any rate, uh, I'm interested in your view as we look forward into the future, of whether there'll be a change uh, in, in the state's participation in local government funding. Mm -hmm. So local government funding is, is something that uh, is obviously a big topic of conversation in our communities as well as at the, at the state capitol. Uh, one thing for folks to be aware of, a lot of people don't realize this, is that by and large state government itself is a pass-through entity. Something like 85% of the money that the, states, that the state collects goes back out. So we're, we're kind of this, this, this organization where we, we receive money from federal sources as well as from our variety of revenue sources at the state level, and then we pass it back out to the tune of something like 85%. So the vast majority of the money doesn't stay in state government. It gets, it gets distributed out to the places where it's needed for education, for you know, infrastructure, for local government, and that kind of thing. Uh, there is a real concern, though, among some people 
that the local government fund is not the most uh, efficient way to do that, and, and that you know, uh, I don't necessarily buy into that argument. By the way, I've been part of a, a, a group that has encouraged us to not. There was a, a there were a group of people that wanted to further cut the, the LGF, and uh, and then there were some of us that stood up and said, no, we, we can't support something like that. And so, if there's any good news, it's that you know it wasn't further reduced in recent budgets, although there were proposals to do that, and, and there was a, a desire by people that thought that that was a, a good thing to do, would, would be to further reduce LGF. I, I thought that was a bad idea. And I think that there's a reason for it. Not every community can sort of, on their own, sustain the level of services, the basic level of services that they need in order to satisfy the demands of, of their citizens. And, and I recognize that local government is where the rubber meets the road, where services are delivered, where public safety is is is, is done, where fire and police and uh, you know uh, and garbage collection and parks and recreation and all these things that that maintain our quality of life and make our communities nice places to live, work, and raise a family is done at the local level. Uh, and so you know I've been very cautious about further cuts to the LGF as far as restoring them back to sort of pre-2010 levels. I, I don't see that coming, quite honestly, uh, anytime soon. But uh, you know, it, it's always worth the conversation. Other questions? Yes, sir. Sir, I'm curious uh, how much, uh, how often stormwater management, rainwater management, however you want to refer to it, comes up among your colleagues. It's a nonpartisan issue, as you know, and and, and if there's any interest in. Any legislative changes, fixes, maybe with a regional uh, perspective? Yeah, so stormwater management, this one's, it's, it's something that's on my mind a lot, and it's something that, uh, it's interesting when I talk to my colleagues, my, my sort of counterparts that serve out west, I was having a conversation with a state legislator uh, from California not too long ago, and they have the exact opposite problem of what we have. Uh, we're blessed with fresh water. And, uh, and it, it, is, it is a blessing, and we need to make sure that we're taking care of it, and we've been doing a lot on water quality uh, as far as dealing with the algal bloom issues that, that are not only affecting Lake Erie, but our inland lakes and, and water uh, rivers as well. Uh, so we're blessed with fresh water, but there's also uh, a challenge that comes with that as far as managing stormwater. And as we know, all of our older cities have combined sewer systems, uh, and as we know, that there's a lot of money being spent currently, and, and it will be spent, uh, to, to remedy that overflow issue uh, and to address that. Now, I just signed on to a bipartisan uh, uh, bill to, to create bonding to, to supply money for, for, for to assist, anyway, uh, with local stormwater projects. Um, it's not gotten a hearing yet. It was just introduced a few weeks ago. Uh, but it was Senator Schifoni from the Youngstown area, who's the, the, the lead Democrat in the Senate. Uh, I signed on to that along with, I think there's a couple other Republicans as well, because I think that there's a need for it. And it's a, re it's a relatively modest ask. It's well within our bonding capacity for the state. And, and you can make the argument that now's a good time to borrow uh, for, for things like that. I think one of the other solutions, and I know that, that particularly and other, other places are, but in southern Suffolk County, we're working on this right now, is the creation of, of a... Uh, of a watershed district. Um, I can tell you, every time we get a hard rain, I really worry about this certain part of my district that has a history of flooding along uh, Barber Road and Norton, and then also Yellow Creek in, in Bath, where we've had some real problems. Uh, and so, you know, I've gotten in my car a couple times when I've been here and not in Columbus when there's a big rainstorm and like gone and, and checked to see where the levels are on that just because it's something that's been worrying me. The ultimate solution to that, though, is that all the communities in that watershed need to share that cost. It's the classic human question of upstream, downstream, right? And this goes back to, you know, uh, a thousand years ago. The village upstream is more than happy to dump a bunch of stuff into the river because they don't have to worry about it. It's the downstream village's problem. Uh, same thing with our watersheds. We have the upstream, downstream question. The people with acres of asphalt and big you know, roofs and everything else that are shedding all kinds of water into that watershed that was never meant for that. Uh, they don't much think it's a problem, but the people downstream recognize that it is. So everybody needs to share in, in, in the infrastructure investment, and it's a significant amount of money, as you know, that, that it costs to, to deal with those issues. But on-site retention uh, and, and, and more permeable surfaces and that kind of thing has to be part of the solution 
Uh, and so, you know, it's something I'm open to. If you've got any ideas, I, I've supported this, this bonding uh, initiative to try to borrow some money that the state can use to, to, uh, to, fund, uh, to fund local uh, water infrastructure projects, but I think that a lot more can be done. Yes, sir. So you're a uh, redistricting nerd. Yeah. I'm an illegal immigration nerd. Okay. And so my question is, which absolutely has nothing to do in this room, but more as a curious resident. Um, what's the state doing to control illegal immigration and the negative impacts it has on uh, the job market in Ohio? Yeah, so uh, immigration is an interesting conversation. It's one that um, is not a uh, as big of a conversation here in Ohio because we're a border state. People forget that a lot of times, but Ohio is a border state, uh, but, but the, we don't have a, a large influx of immigrants coming from the Canadian border yet. Um, <laughs> bring hockey and, and a beer or something. But anyway, um, it's... Uh, so I, I'm, I'm from the school of thought that immigration is a net positive for our country, and it has been uh, for 200 years. It's been what has made us strong, but immigration should happen through a legal framework, uh, which is currently broken. The, 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 the framework for legal immigration is, is broken right now. When my family came here 100 years ago, my dad's family came here 100 years ago, uh, they stumbled off a boat on an island in, in New York Harbor and somebody checked to make sure that they had, didn't have hair lice and they, they made them take an oath and, and then they, they dropped the A off the end of their name and made it an E and then they sent them off to, to you know, do good things as, a, as, a, uh, as an American. And, 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 and every generation uh, since has, has, has assimilated into and become a part of the fabric of this country. So immigration is a positive thing. I mean, particularly in a region like ours, we have a population problem. We need more population in Northeast Ohio, and I know that, that Jason's written on that, right? Uh, you know, we have a, a population issue, and so immigration can be a good thing, uh, but we need the federal government to reform the immigration system, which there's all kinds of partisan problems why that's not happening, uh, so that we can have legal immigration, and robust legal immigration. We want people to come and, and, and be part of this country, but we want them to do it in a legal way. So I think that there does need to be, you know, enforcement, uh, but uh, we also have to be practical about we're not going to take uh, millions of people that are now in this country and have been for years and, and put them on buses and ship them somewhere else. It's just not practical. It's not possible. It's not humane either. Uh, and so this is, a, this is something that we have to wrestle with as, as a country and make sure that we get it right because immigration is part of the great American story and always has been. Uh, but we need to be thoughtful about it, and, and particularly, I think that the thing that we need to do and should be done today is H-1B reform, uh, which is the process where you know we've got uh, we've got students that come from all over the world, the best and brightest, some of the, the the most brilliant people in the world, come here to get their college education in the United States, and then as soon as they graduate and have all this knowledge, we say, all right, now you got to go, and we kick them out and make them go back to whatever country they came from. We need to keep them here and we need to let them start building their careers here in Ohio. That would be a good thing for our state to keep these really talented brains here in the state of Ohio and in the country. So H-1B reform needs to be done today. Um, but uh, you know, we, need, we have a larger immigration reform problem that we need to address, and, and, and it's not a simple thing about, you know, people say, oh, we're gonna build a wall. Walls don't really work. I mean, you know, there, there, there does need to be better border enforcement um, but uh, for every wall, there's a way to go over it or under it or through it. So it includes, you know, better sensor technology, um, better enforcement, just human enforcement, which I've, I've worked with the Border Patrol. One of my uh, jobs when I was in the Army, I augmented the Border Patrol on the U.S.-Mexican border, and so I've helped them bust drug runners. Um, it's a difficult thing to enforce a border that is thousands of miles long. Uh, and it's something that, that we need to, uh, we need, but it's not a simple solution like we'll just build a wall and everything will be fine. That's not, that's not the answer. So, other questions? Mayor. Thank you very much, uh, Senator. My question is, uh, I just returned from the CEO for Cities uh, uh, conference in Indianapolis and it was based upon the theme general theme of the uh, not only uh, attaining talent for the country, because it was very clear that uh, finance and jobs follow human capital, and wherever that is. And a great question about the uh, thought and your answer about the immigration. 
but we also have talent that needs to be developed here. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to hear your thoughts on uh, where you feel the state is, and especially our district, in providing the appropriate uh, uh, resources for developing or enhancing the talent we have here to answer tomorrow's economic needs. Gotcha. Okay, so the question is talent, uh, and, uh, and and I'm glad to see that the, our, our wonderful folks here are bringing, bringing your lunch out, because I don't want to be standing in between you and your food, that's a bad thing. Uh, but the mayor's question has to do with talent, which I, I think really one of the sort of transformational challenges uh, of our generation is, is talent. Every business owner I talk to, every shop that I visit, every factory that I visit, um, you know, I, I think it's, it's not a surprise to the folks in this room. What I hear is that, that uh, I would hire 10 welders tomorrow if I could find them. I would hire 10 truck drivers or CNC machinists or engineers. So we have people that want to work but don't have the skills, and we have businesses that desperately need skilled people that can't find them. And so, again, there's, there's, a, 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 there's a, a misalignment there, and it's up to the public sector, it's up to government to remedy that misalignment. Uh, and so, you know, I think one of the good things that's starting to happen in Ohio is that our community colleges and our technical schools and some of our schools that, that really train those folks that do those jobs are, are, are really reaching out to the private sector instead of just training people in whatever they think is important, they're starting to train people in the jobs that are in demand right now. Uh, and, that's, and that's good news. Uh, I think that, that one of the other things, and particularly one of the areas where we have a shortage, is in some of the skilled trades uh, and I think that there's a, a multi-part solution to that. One of the things that we need to do is we need to stop discouraging kids that want to build things and fix things and, and, and do things with their hands. That's an honorable way to earn a living, but for too long, uh, we've been telling these kids, no, you've got to go to college where you're a square peg in a round hole at some you know, liberal arts education, which is wonderful and very important for a lot of careers. But kids that want to fix things and build things and repair things, we need to encourage them to contact the building trades and go to the apprenticeship programs that all of our wonderful building trades unions in the region have and get trained in those skills that will put food on their table and be a really honorable way to, to earn their living throughout their career. And so uh, I think one good thing that's starting to happen is we're bringing shop class back into seventh grade uh, and into middle schools. Who remembers making their sheet metal dustpan and shop class, right? I mean, and, and so for kids that are interested in that, they want to they want to build things and create things. It gives them that exposure to that, and they realize I can build a career on this. I can I can become a machinist. I can earn a living at that. I don't have to get sort of pigeonholed uh, into a track that's not going to work well for me. So I think that's that's part of the solution. And then again, engaging uh, our institutions of of, of learning, uh, tech schools, trade schools, community colleges, that kind of things, to make sure that they're teaching the applicable skills that the workforce needs. And uh, and so you know that's the challenge that we have to face. Hey, thank you. I've given the. Do I have time for one more question? All right. All right. If there's one more question, I'll take it and then I'll wrap up. I covered it. I'll move. Most got another question. Quick question. Yeah, so I mean, no, it wouldn't be illegal. I think that, that, that either tying it to like a CPI inflator or, or simply making it a percentage based tax instead of a fixed number of pennies per gallon would be the way to fix that. Unfortunately, I don't think that there's sufficient political courage among a lot of people to do that. Well, again, that would be that it would be portrayed as a tax and uh, and so you know again, I, I think that it's, it's something that that, uh, that we need to talk about, uh, and, and I think that hopefully when and if the decision is made to adjust up the motor fuel tax, that next time it's it's either indexed to a CPI inflator. Uh, or that it's made a percentage-based tax so that it rises and falls with the cost of the commodity. So, anyway, hey, enjoy lunch, everybody. Thank you so much.